Welcome back everyone. I'm back in front of the purple wall and today I wanted to do a follow-up video on my Blink video, but this one is going to be focusing on blinking once again, but specifically for people who are interested in getting under the hood. So this is another embedded systems video. I've made several of those recently. If this is the first one you're seeing and you're feeling like you've jumped into the middle of a conversation that was already in progress, you may wanna go back and watch some of those. I'll link to them in the description. Watching those videos may help this video make a little more sense. Today I'm gonna to be using the same hardware I used in my last Blink video. Specifically, I'm going to use the Arduino Uno, which is an AVR based microcontroller. And I'm going to use an MSP430 FR5969. And why am I using two? Because I want you to be able to see the similarities and differences. Because we're gonna be doing doing roughly the same thing on each piece of hardware and a lot of it's gonna be the same, but I want you to see where some of the differences come in. And I tend to use the MSP430s in my research more often. I know that platform better than the AVRs. And so it's bound to show up in future videos and I want you to be familiar with it. So let's start out with some preliminaries. For microcontroller programming, you need two things. The first is a cross compiler. Now a cross compiler is just like any compiler like GCC or Clang that you use on your laptop or desktop, but it's different in one way in that a cross compiler compiles code that's going to run on a different machine. When I compile using GCC on my laptop, that code is going to run on my laptop. With a cross compiler, I'm going to compile using a version of GCC that creates code for an AVR or an MSP430. The second thing you need is some way to actually get that code onto the microcontroller that you're programming. For this video, for the AVRs, I'm going to use AVR Dude, which is a tortured acronym for the AVR downloader uploader. That's a bit of a stretch, but it's a name that's hard to forget. So anyway, we're using AVR Dude for the AVR side. On the MSP430 side, we're going to use MSP Debug, which is an open source, freely available program provided by Daniel Beer. Thank you, Daniel. And also we'll use a library that is provided by Texas Instruments that will help out. And of course, you can find links to all the software stuff in the video description. So let's jump into the code. First of all, I wanna start with the AVR. Remember from my Arduino example, the Blink program looked like this. There were two functions, setup and loop. Setup runs first, loop then runs over and over again. So here we're just going to have one main function, but it's going to do roughly the same thing. We're going to have an infinite loop down here. And then we're going to put all of our setup code, our initialization code up here before the loop. And then whatever we want to happen over and over again, we're going to put down here inside the loop. Just like before, we're going to start by putting the pin into output mode. We do that by writing to a control register. Now, you may have heard of registers before. As programs run, a lot of intermediate variables are stored in registers, which are just small chunks of really fast memory. And a lot of the time you don't even realize they're there because compilers typically handle all register accesses under the hood. So many of you may have heard of them. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you're not even aware that registers were there. But when we program microcontrollers, we end up seeing the registers because the registers typically provide ways that we can interact with the processor and we can access different features that the processor has to offer. So in this case, I want to put a pin into output mode and we do that by setting a specific bit in a specific register to one just like this. The DDRB register controls the pin modes for port B. We want to use pin five of port B. Why? Well, we want to blink the LED connected to Arduino pin number 13. Arduino may call it number 13, but the processor calls it port B pin five or B5 for short. And you can see that here on this pinout diagram that shows the processor pins and what Arduino calls them. It's the same pin, just different names. So this line is updating the DDRB register. And notice that I use or equals or or assign instead of just assignment. And this is because port B has eight pins and we only wanna mess with one of them. I just wanna set one pin, pin five to output and I wanna leave all the other pins exactly how they were. So or equals sets bit five to one and leaves the others as they were. And that makes B5 an output. We don't even need a fancy function call. We just need to write to that register and B5 is an output. Now down in our while loop, we're going to do the actual blinking just as before. To do this, we'll use the port B register, which tells the processor whether we want our B5 pin to be high or low. A one means high and a zero means low. And again, we use or equals in case there is something going on with one of those other pins, we don't wanna mess with it. So this code right here sets the fifth bit in the port B register to one, which tells the processor to set pin B5 to high, and that turns the LED on. And now just like before, we wait. And for this, we're going to use delay MS, which is going to, we just give it a number of milliseconds and it's going to wait. And then afterwards, we wanna turn the LED off, which, so for that, we want to clear that bit that we set before down to zero. And we do that like this. 
Now, this line sometimes throws people who aren't used to doing a lot of binary code work. They're not, they're not doing a lot of bit twiddling in their code. So let me explain. So what this is saying is take this binary value and then invert it. So that makes this pattern all ones except for bit five, which is the position that I want to clear back to zero. Then we and that pattern with the current bits in port B, and that's going to force bit five to zero and leave all the other bits as they are, because one ended with anything is just that original thing. So I hope that makes sense. Now we delay again, and that's it. Now we wanna compile and run it. For this, I wrote a simple make file. I think you'll find that compiling is a little more complicated with embedded programs, so I strongly recommend that you use a make file, a rake file, or a shell script, or some kind of build system that automates the building of your programs, because otherwise you're gonna have a lot of options, a lot of typing of commands, and you're gonna get tired. You're gonna find this out one way or another. I'm just hoping that I can help you out, but use a build system. Okay, so a quick tour of this make file. Note that this make file uses automatic variables. If you haven't seen these before, you might wanna check out another video of mine. I'll put a link to that in the description, as well as a link to another video just on make file basics, in case this is new. So up top, we have our compiler options. I'm using AVRGCC as my C compiler. And like I mentioned before, there are a few more options than I might usually have if I were writing a simple example that was gonna run on my laptop. I'm telling the compiler to optimize the code for size, not necessarily for speed. I want to have small size, and that's because I don't have a lot of memory on this processor, so I want the code to be small. Now, this program is super simple, so this probably isn't necessary, but you're going to see a lot of people use this option as a default on microcontrollers that don't have very much memory. I'm also telling it how fast I want the microcontroller's clock to run. 16 megahertz is typical for this microcontroller, but a lot of MCUs let you slow down the clock in order to save power. So for now, we're just gonna stick with the default. And finally, we tell it what processor to compile for. AVR GCC can compile code for a lot of different AVR-based microcontrollers. And right here, I'm telling it which one of those microcontrollers to actually generate code for. If I get this wrong, I can expect either no results or really weird results. So you gotta make sure you get this right. So next, I'm gonna use my make file to help automate loading my code after it's compiled. So this line down here just looks in the slash dev folder for a device that looks like an Arduino Uno and grabs its name. On a Windows machine, this is gonna look different. Your device is gonna be called something like COM1, COM2, COM4, COM12, whatever. And in Windows, you don't have a slash dev directory to actually search through, so you may have to find a different way to do this. This make file also assumes that I only have one device attached and that's the one I want. So if I plug four Arduinos into this machine, it's always going to grab the first one. And so if you're doing anything different, you may need to adjust this for your specific machine or for the particular scenario that you're trying to make work. Okay, now we actually get to start compiling. I have a couple rules here. I have one rule that compiles .c files to .out files. That's pretty standard. I have another rule that takes a compile.out file and copies out part of it. It extracts the part in the EEPROM segment, which is what we want to put on our microcontroller. And it's going to extract it in Intel hex format because that's the format that our programmer wants it in. And then I have a rule to install a .hex file onto the device. AVR Dude has a lot of different options and I'll leave you to explore them all in your own time. But the key ones here are that I'm programming an Arduino board with an Atmega 328P. I'm telling it what serial port to use and what baud rate or communication speed to use. Finally, I tell it what action I want it to take which is to write new code to the processor's flash memory. So it is a little more complicated than my prior examples, but nothing too terrible. Okay, so let's try it out. I can compile it and I can install it and the new code is running and the light is blinking, as you can see here. And now let's go back to the code because this code is pretty terrible. It's not the worst code I've ever written. It's not the most unreadable code I've ever written, but that might be because it's very short. The main thing I don't like here is that there are these magic binary constants. When I come back to this code tomorrow, I'm probably not gonna remember what any of this meant. And I wrote it in this way so that you could see exactly what I was doing, but there are some standard functions, defines, and macros that we can use to make this code a little easier to read. For example, I can rewrite my binary constants here like this. The BV macro is short for binary value or bit value. It's defined like this and port B5 is set to the bit position of B5 in the register. So this gives us the same result. And if I add in some comments, now this is definitely a bit easier to digest. Okay, now there's one other change I can make and I just wanna point it out if I wanna make this code a little more compact. So down here in the while loop, we can actually remove that second part of the blink, the part that turns off the LED. And we can actually change the top one. We can change the or equal to an XOR equal. And now this just uses XOR instead of or which means that it toggles the bit. So if it's a zero, it's going to become a one. 
If it's a one, it will become a zero. And that makes my code shorter, so you can decide if that's easier or more difficult to read, but it's an option and it does make for more compact code. Okay, so that's the AVR version of our Blink under the hood. Now let's look at the MSP430. This code is going to be very similar with a few differences. One difference is that I'm going to blink two lights because my board has two lights on it. And you can see on the board here that the pins are labeled 1.0 and 4.6. On the AVR, ports were specified by letters, on the MSP430, ports have numbers. So 1.0 is port one, pin zero. The other is port four, pin six. So in the code, things are almost the same, except that we have two odd statements up here on top. I'm not going to go into a lot of details about these today, but they show up at the top of most all MSP430 programs, and they simply turn off the watchdog timer so it doesn't reboot the device at odd times, and it removes the port lock so that changes to the port registers will actually take effect. My blink isn't going to work so well if I don't do that. Now moving on down below, you can see the P1DIR is the register that tells the MCU what direction or mode mode, input or output, port 1's pins should be set to, 1 is output, 0 is input. Then the P1 out register tells the MCU whether the output value of the pin should be high or low. So here I'm setting pin 1.0 to low initially and pin 4.6 to high initially just to be different, to mix things up a little bit. Then down in the loop, I'm going to delay. Now in this case, we're delaying cycles rather than milliseconds, but the idea is the same. If we were running at eight megahertz, eight million cycles would be around one second. The default is one megahertz, so one million cycles is about a second, but we could also use 500 kilohertz, 500,000 cycles to be half a second. And then we simply toggle the bits. So there are definitely some differences, but nothing too dramatic. In both cases, we're following the same pattern. So let's look at the make file for this one. It's a little different. I don't currently have the MSP430 GCC compiler includes on my path. So I'm providing some of those paths explicitly here in the make file. This is useful if you wanna have multiple different compilers or versions of compilers that you're using at the same time. This will vary depending on how things are installed on your machine. And you could set it up to remove all this code up here altogether, but I just haven't done that. This is the way I've set it up on my machine. So once again, I tell it what device I'm programming. I tell it what compiler I'm using and what options I'm using. I tell it what driver to use to install new code. In this case, it's TILib, which is the library that Texas Instruments provides for installing new code. After that, things are pretty standard. I have a rule that compiles .c files to .l files. Notice that the extension here really doesn't matter. I could have used .out like I did with the AVR example. It's arbitrary and it's totally a matter of preference. And then I have an install rule that uses MSP debug to load the compiled binary onto the device. This allow FW update option just tells it to update the programmer's firmware if it needs to be updated, if it's out of date. This is totally optional as long as the firmware doesn't need to be updated. Notice I didn't have to convert to a .hex file. This is just because MSP debug and AVR dude work differently and they want the binary code in different formats. Also note that I didn't have to tell MSP debug what port I'm connected to. It just figured it out, which is really nice. But really, in both cases, the commands are doing the same thing, just slight differences in the tools. And let's make sure it works. So we'll compile it and we install it. And wonderful, we can bask in the alternating blinks from our latest embedded program. Now you may be wondering how I knew what register names and function calls were available for these platforms because they are a bit different and they vary by platform. And this is where things get a little bit shaky. One of the most frustrating things I find about embedded programming is the documentation. And that's actually one reason, one good argument for why you should use Arduino is that the documentation for Arduino is actually pretty solid and things just go downhill from there. The AVR has okay documentation. There is a user manual for the AVR GCC standard library. You can see it right here. This is where it tells you about the BV macro for example. I'll include a link to this in the description. It's not the best documentation I've ever seen, but it's usable. But I really shouldn't complain because the documentation for the MSP430 is worse. I've been using the MSP430 for years. I have really yet to see any software documentation for the MSP430, except for TI does include a tiny bit of documentation that is completely Windows focused and completely specific to their IDE, which is CCS. And of course, any of you that regularly watch this channel, you know how I feel about IDEs. And so you're not really surprised that I'm not recommending an IDE in a video about getting under the hood, because let's face it, that's the whole point of IDEs is to not let you get under the hood. So how do I figure out things with the MSP430? Well, I'm kind of embarrassed to admit it, but I look in the code. If I look at the code that comes with the compiler, I can see that for each different MSP430, there is a header file with the same name. If I look in that header file, it shows me all of the register definitions and a lot of different constants for setting the various registers and between this header file and the user guide for the processor, I can usually figure out 
how to interact with the hardware. As far as higher level functions go, I often guess, say that I want to use memcopy or string copy. I'm guessing it's in there because it's usually part of the C standard library. So I might just try to use it, include string.h, that's where it's usually defined, and I'll just go ahead and call it. In this case, I would be lucky and it would work just fine. But when in doubt, I also have often gone into the libc source code that came with the compiler, and I start hunting around to see if the function that I want is actually in one of the header files. Now, this may sound crazy to you, I know. I really like the MSP430s. I like using them. I think TI is a good company as far as hardware is concerned. They just sometimes seem to treat software as an afterthought and their documentation just isn't really great. But I've actually been able to still get work done and it hasn't been too terrible. At this point, I mostly just want you to know what you're getting yourself into so that you don't hunt around for something that at least to my knowledge isn't there. And that seems like a good place to stop for today. There is so much more we could talk about with embedded systems and there's a lot more we're going to talk about with embedded systems. There's even a lot more more that we could talk about in terms of how you blink lights. Specifically, this isn't the only way to blink lights on a microcontroller. We could also use timers and we could write interrupt service routines and handle interrupts every time the timer fires. And we're actually gonna do that in a future video. You'll have to be a little patient, but it is coming. But for now, I hope this video gives you a feel for embedded programming, what it's like, and how you make progress even when you don't have an IDE or a whole bunch of library support. But you can just access the raw hardware through your C code. It's not particularly difficult or scary as long as you've got a good foundation in C and as as long as you understand the hardware you're working with, there's a lot of really cool stuff you can do without a lot of infrastructure on top. So happy holidays, everyone. I hope this is helpful and I hope you're enjoying your break from your classes. All of you that do get a break from classes, I'm sorry if you don't get a break from classes for the holidays, but happy coding and I'll see you in my next video.